So essentially, we learned that it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems, including ecosystems that have been damaged over very vast areas and over long historical time. Hello everyone and thank you for being here today. Sorry for the little bit of confusion. Uh, our panel is going to be discussing a very important topic which is mitigation and adaptation. Uh, we have a very esteemed panel. Uh, we're going to start with uh, recorded uh, statements from Dr. Peter Carter and uh, I will do a general introduction of, of the people also sitting with me. Uh, to my far right is Professor Jim Bendel. He is uh, a professor of sustainability leadership at the University of Cumbria. And to my near right is John Liu. John Liu is a journalist, filmmaker, and founder of Echo Restoration Camps. There are 55 of these Echo Restoration Camps on six continents. This is a feat that he has achieved in six years, six continents in six years. And to my left, I have Paul Beckwith, who is a climate educator, and he's very well known and followed on YouTube. Um, so without further ado, I would like to get into this discussion on the importance of adaptation and mitigation. And I would like to begin with a recorded statement from Canada from Dr. Peter Carter. Hello. The huge issue of adaptation to climate change is covered by Working Group 2 of the IPC 6 assessment. I have selected some extracts. The first one, climate change is a global threat to which all people and ecosystems are vulnerable. To be effective, adaptation must go hand in hand with rapid deep cuts in greenhouse gas emissions. There are limits to adaptation that depend largely on resilience, but as temperature increases, resilience decreases. And then we have extreme weather events. We are near those limits even in the Northern Hemisphere. The Northern Hemisphere summer of this year, 2022, of unprecedented extremes right across the Northern Hemisphere, Today, 42% of Europe is still in drought and 60% of the US is still in drought. Clearly, we have no more time left. Working Group 3 says that global emissions have to decline immediately for 2C as well as 1.5C. The report finds that many species and ecosystems are currently near or beyond their adaptation limits and people that rely on them to survive are currently near or beyond their adaptation limits. That single quote says it all. 3.5 billion people live in contexts that are highly vulnerable to climate change. Africa. Since 1961, crop productivity growth in Africa shrunk by a third due to climate change. So Africa has to be prioritized for funding and assistance for adaptation development. Adaptability is determined by degree and rate of climate change. Climate change is accelerating, the WMO told us. On current policies and trends, we will reach a catastrophic 3.2 degrees C this century. That's from Working Group 3. And on that scenario, we reach 1.5 degrees C by 2030 and 2 degrees C by 2050. So for adaptation and mitigation for all of us, we must prepare for 1.5 degrees C starting right away. 1.5 C around 2030, Working Group 2 has enabling adaptation conditions. Extreme world poverty and hunger have to be put right in short order. World hunger is increasing again due to climate change and conflict that the working group two say are going together. Worldwide development 
of adequate public services to respond to increasing disasters and diseases has to be started immediately. Debt for already vulnerable poor countries, their debts have to be forgiven unconditionally. The IPCC estimates for developing countries that adaptation alone needs $127 billion a year by 2030. Of course, that's wrong. They need it right away, and they should have had it years ago. The 1992 Climate Change Convention said that developed country parties shall assist the developing country parties that are particularly vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change in meeting the costs of adaptation to those adverse effects. Article 4, Para 4. I hope you get my point. So back to Working Group 2, Adaptation Enabling Conditions. Of course, the climate has to be stabilized. That's the top enabler. And for that, immediate global emissions put into decline. For that, all fossil fuels have to be phased out, but phased out fast. Fossil fuel subsidies must be terminated immediately, unconditionally. Working Group 2 says that to avoid mounting losses, urgent accelerated action is required to adapt to climate change while making rapid deep cuts in greenhouse gas emissions. So I'll close by saying that the survival of many billions of people in the near term depends totally on the immediate decline of emissions globally and then immediate provision donated of large amounts of funding for those to develop adaptation. My final word is that that applies to all of us. It applies to everyone in the world. Thank you so much to Dr. Peter Carter, sending a thank you long distance, and I would um, second his cry for us to stop war everywhere on this planet. And now I will turn it over to Professor Jim Bendel. Thank you for the uh, invitation. Uh, thank you for coming. We have a communications problem, clearly, because what we've heard is terrifying, and yet the world seems to be very good at carrying on as usual. I'm going to speak about that communications problem right now. Because just as political support for climate action is growing, so political resistance to climate action is also growing. I'm sharing this information for the first time today. The use of the hashtag climate scam has exploded since July of this year, from never exceeding more than 3,000 tweets in any month up to June 2022. It's been used 70,000 to 100,000 times per month in the four months since. Compare that to the hashtag climate justice, which has averaged about 30,000 tweets per month for the last two years, and almost hit 100,000 unique tweets in the month of COP26 in Glasgow this time last year, what with all the world's media attention. But now, climate scam is being used two and a half times for every climate justice tweet throughout the last four months. So these Twitter trends are just one indicator of a growing resistance to climate action. So here at a climate event, we might ask, how can people dismiss something happening before their very eyes? Today I'm offering an answer as a professor and a political advisor who specializes in strategic communications. I assess that resistance to climate action is growing partly because of the bad way climate issues have been communicated to the public by experts and politicians. Badly technical, badly elitist, and now badly authoritarian. I believe that reflects a self-serving response from the establishment that's partly to blame for all that current backlash, which is represented by this data on social media. So I want to be very clear how I see things. In only 200, in only 200 years, industrial activity has increased world temperatures by an amount equivalent to 20% of the total range ever experienced by Homo sapiens since we walked on, on Earth over 200,000. Messing with weather systems already damaging both wilderness and agriculture, let alone settlements and infrastructure. And the speed, that's the crucial thing, the speed is unprecedented. In my 50 years on this Earth, our planet's been warming 170 times faster than it was cooling 
for the previous 7,000 years. And that's a speed that ecosystems cannot cope with. Unfortunately, communications about this have been badly technical, using incomparable averages. If the public are told that the world is already warmed by 1.2 degrees, how bad do we expect them to feel? Intuitively, people might think of daily maximum temperatures where an extra 1.2 degrees isn't a big deal. Feelings might shift a bit once realizing that that's an average for night and day, summer, winter, and over land and sea. But still, there is nothing to compare that with, that fractional, uh, that, that small amount. Such as by knowing that it's an average, it was an average of 13.6 degrees back in the year 1850 before rising to our current 15 Cs average. So that's a big shift over a tiny period in world history. But if we're stuck discussing incomparable averages, we will lose to those who dismiss us as wanting to hurt their standard of living for a mere 1.5 degrees. Because in mass communications, once you need to explain, you've already lost. The rush to cash in on the climate crisis that we're now seeing in the halls of this conference is not only generating a backlash, but it's also marginalizing radical critiques. They demand we stay positive, that we will, will be saved, and saved by technology and big business. This is what I call climate bright-siding the public on reality. Because there is some inevitable warming ahead, due to how much heat is within the oceans and how much carbon is in the atmosphere. In response, some say that technologies like mechanical direct air capture of CO2 can help. However, their low effectiveness and high energy demands should not give us confidence. Meanwhile, research debunks the argument that economic growth can be sufficiently decoupled from resources so that the world economy can keep growing without terrible consequences. And both psychological research and activist testimony shows us that anticipating difficult futures is not demotivating. Instead, believing that technology and big business will sort things out for us is demotivating. But as impacts worsen, atmospheric carbon increases and the science becomes more troubling, I think we're seeing a new mistake in how leaders are thinking and talking about climate. Oftentimes, when leaders realize that the systems they administer are threatened, they respond with draconian measures that make matters worse. For instance, brutal approaches to law and order in the wake of disasters. With climate, such elite panic could inspire leaders to curtail personal freedoms. Resistant populations might then regard action on climate change as synonymous with coercion and coercive power rather than collaboration. And we're already hearing authoritarian statements on climate issues. Instead, the future communications on this crisis must be focused on freeing us all from the systems that drive us to dump costs onto each other and nature. So let's work with the fact that most people want to do the right thing if they aren't forced by circumstance to do otherwise. So the communications mistakes that I've described result from the kinds of people that are currently dominating this agenda. And it's why a bottom-up movement on climate justice is going to be central to everything on climate going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jim. And thank you for sharing that uh, startling graphic. It's actually quite frightening. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing from John Liu some good news. Um, so let's hear uh, what you have to say. And I'd like to see, um, we're going to see a little video first. Yes. Um, uh, I'd like to thank you all for being here and for inviting me. I'd like to also thank the Common Land Foundation and the Mustard Seed Trust that make it possible for me to do this work. Um, in 1979, I went to China to help open the CBS News Bureau. And there I had the opportunity to film the rise of China from poverty and isolation and then the collapse of the Soviet Union. No, just keep going, keep going. You were fine. Um, yes, this is China's Lus Plateau. In 1994, the World Bank asked me to go there 
to film the baseline study for the rehabilitation of this massively degraded landscape. Now, basically, they employed the entire population to do restoration. And what's interesting about this, it's, it, it was unbelievable to imagine that you could do anything with this kind of a landscape. And they were using their own hands and, and simple tools. So this is what it looked like when they began. And this is what it was able to do in 14 years. So essentially, we learned that it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems, including ecosystems that have been damaged over very vast areas and over long historical time. And I began, I stopped doing uh, journalism and I began to study ecology. I've now studied ecology for 30 years in 90 countries around the world. Restoration of the earth is the great work of our time. If we choose to do this, we can restore the entire planet. This is the only way that we can actually deal with sequestration of carbon, of re-regulation of the hydrological cycle, and of controlling ec uh, extreme and erratic weather events. The principles that I learned in ecology are that there's always more biodiversity, always more biomass, and always more accumulated organic matter in natural evolutionary succession. And when we're talking about communications, when we're talking about governance, when we're talking about commerce, buying and selling things, we are talking about abiotic systems, materialism. We are a living planet. It's the only planet we know that has an oxygenated atmosphere, a freshwater system, fertile soils, and amazing biodiversity. And this is where humans arrived, in the Garden of Eden. And since human civilization began, we have been cutting down the vegetation. We have been destroying the hydrological cycle, destroying the soil fertility, losing the biodiversity. And these are the life support systems on the earth. Now, this, I, I want to tell you that we created the ecosystem restoration camps. I was having dreams because I was studying this, and I found that I was dreaming about people restoring the earth systems. And I had this dream repeatedly, and I thought, I'm crazy. Nobody's going to do that. I keep making these films, and nobody's listening to me. I've been doing this now for 30 years. So how could this be? But I wrote an essay called Earth Restoration Peace Camps, and people began to show up. Tens of thousands of people said, that's what we need, and that's what we want. This is a bottom-up movement that is working all over the world. In six years, there are 55 camps in six continents. So in these camps, it's possible to restore the hydrology, restore the soils, restore the vegetation. And not only that, but it ensures food security. We're recommending all of these places have central kitchens, creator spaces, and cultural stages so that as things deteriorate in the society when nobody has any other ideas, the communities themselves can make themselves resilient and able to feed everyone and take care of everyone. This can happen in a really beautiful environment. We can, it's inexpensive, it's the lowest cost and the most effective. And it allows us to start implementing things like biogas, solar solar energy and take care of everyone so that really no one is left behind and if we get this right we apply it to the refugee situation to the homeless to the hungry because they have the same rights and the same energy that if we use it and they participate we all participate we will live and take care of one another we'll be safe we'll be fine so I highly recommend that you look at ecosystemrestorationcamps.org. If you're interested, I have dozens of films I've published on the BBC 
and on National Geographic and, and all over the television stations. My writings in journals are also in there on this, this uh, thing. Common Land Foundation has 2 million hectares in restoration as well, ecosystemrestorationcamps.org, and that's my email. I'd love to talk to anybody who's interested. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, I have to say that was quite inspiring. That's one of the more inspiring um, talks that I've heard so far in the COP. And just a quick question, um, is this a type of camp where people could go for a few weeks, or how does that work? Each camp is autonomous, self-organizing, and self-governing. They're based on what the community needs and wants. I, I'm working on one, especially in Somalia, that we think is going to become, uh, it's called Dryland Solutions. And I think it's going to be a, a model for places all around the world. Well, thank you so much. So very, very inspiring, wonderful work. Um, and now I'm going to pass it over to Paul Beckwith. As mentioned, Paul Beckwith is a climate science educator. So I'm ready to be educated. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure many of you have seen uh, the before and after images of uh, glaciers, for example. A picture of a glacier from 100 years ago and a picture of that region now, um, which is basically bare rock. Well, the uh, image that uh, John just showed of the, um, you know, completely barren landscape and, uh, you know, how over time, without any human intervention, it would eventually maybe restore itself, maybe not. But with human intervention, smart human intervention, um, clearly, uh, you know, it green the whole area was greened. It's just, it's just a striking before and after photo. Um, but of the good kind, not, not of a glacier disappearing. So that was, that was incredible. And, uh, you know, Jem was showing that image, the uh, plot showing um, that we, we have a problem with uh, social media still and communication. There's far too many climate deniers who are um, impeding process at all levels. And it seems to be getting worse, as he showed in the last few months, uh, you know, with the climate scam hashtags. And uh, we see a lot of things going the wrong direction. We should be making progress on um, restoring the earth, um, reducing CO2, things like that. But we're still not anywhere close to doing that. We still hold these uh, conferences, these COP conferences. and. Uh, you know, are we really making any progress? Um, it's questionable. So, you know, the number I look at as a, from a science point of view is the greenhouse gas uh, concentration. So once again, um, we're setting new records in uh, greenhouse gas levels of, both, of CO2 in the atmosphere, of methane, of uh, nitrous oxide, and you know, lately, uh, scientists have been making a lot more noise about the methane levels because methane levels are just shooting up. They're accelerating. And perhaps the hydroxyl sink, which removes methane from the atmosphere, is maybe weakening. Uh, we're not sure. But there, there's a frightening rise of, of methane concentrations in the atmosphere. So all of these powerful greenhouse gases are trapping tremendous amounts of heat. So when people talk about um, solutions, of course, the, the nature-based natural methods are, are just brilliant, like the work that, that John is doing. I've always talked about uh, sort of a three-legged approach or three-legged bar stool where we need to slash fossil fuel emissions. We need to uh, remove, actively remove CO2 from the atmosphere, uh, carbon dioxide removal, and that would include restoration of land. I mean, greening of barren regions is a huge carbon uh, sink, uh, a huge way of capturing carbon. Also, uh, there's a lot of interesting work being done in the oceans. Uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting ideas using things like ocean pasture restoration to pull carbon from the atmosphere. And the third leg of the bar stool, if you like, is uh, solar radiation management. And there's also lots of fascinating ideas 
with this. Um, you know, I, I love the uh, idea of the MEER MIR project to try to offset some of the warming, especially when we have a reduction of aerosols as we clean up uh, fossil fuel emissions. So check out MIR.org. Um, there's also ideas um, of marine cloud brightening to create low-level clouds to um, have a direct effect of, um, of blocking uh, some sunlight and causing, allowing some cooling on the planet to help get back to some sort of stability in our climate system because we are undergoing abrupt climate change and it's accelerating rapidly to the detriment of humanity and all the animals and plants on the earth. Thank you so much, Paul. I like that you brought up uh, a plethora of ideas and ways to restore this planet. And I think that that is exactly what we need. We need to work with the human mind, which is so incredibly important. And when the mind is concentrated and focused, it can do so much, as, as you showed in that lovely, lovely video. And Paul outlined so many different ways and so many things that people are doing. And I just encourage everyone in whatever capacity to just continue to work towards restoring this one planet that we have. And I, I also want to thank you all for being here. And let's restore hope. Let's re restore faith in humanity because that's what we need before we can restore anything. I want to offer a very special thanks to Sustainable Population Australia. Without them, we couldn't be here today. And the International Society for Ecological Economics. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>